Good morning. Thank, thank you for inviting me to talk uh, today about uh, optimising the blood culture pathway. And the, um, I think the reason why we're here today, or there's lots of other reasons why we should be talking about the pathway, is this, is, is antibiotic resistance. This is an NDM1 E. coli. And you're probably familiar with all of these figures, but I think if you just look at it written out, uh, it sort of makes, well, certainly made more of an impact on the, when, one of, when one of my colleagues did this. So the cost is roughly $13,000 per, per person on this planet. And in terms of deaths, uh, if it carries on like this in 2050, that will be all the population in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales in one year will be dying from antibiotic resistance. And in just under seven years, everybody on these islands will have passed away. <laughs> so it's sobering thought. Well, it, it's the spread across the planet. It's not just those who are going to be hit by this. Right? Uh, so one in every thousand will die potentially from an untreatable antibiotic-resistant infection. And we should all be aware of this. And what's come out of this is diagnostic stewardship, using diagnostics to actually improve or prevent antibiotic prescribing. And I think we've seen with flu now how rapid diagnostic at the front door can actually alter a lot of things, including infection control. Uh, this was the title of a talk given uh, what, five years ago at a national meeting. And whilst it appears flippant, it's actually begging a serious question. Actually, who's more... Uh, who, who takes us seriously more, the, the bacteria or the microbiologist? And we'll come back to this at the end and you can make your own decision. So if we go back to this paper from more than 30 years ago from Rick Holloman uh, down at St George's Hospital in London, he said that approximately half of the patients with a significant positive blood culture, uh, their antibiotic therapy was changed on the basis of results. And back then they said that whilst an antibiotic policy allows effective treatment to many patients, there remains a need for early microbiological diagnosis. And this was back in the honeymoon period. If you gave a third generation cephalosporin and a minor glycoside or a quinolone, you didn't even need to sense the antibiotic sensitivities because they were, always, they were almost always universally sensitive. But in the intervening 30 years, masses have moved on. We know that bacteria have been busy, they've developed very sophisticated <laughs> resistance mechanisms and they've grouped them together now and we're talking about pan-resistant organisms. In terms of the technology, we actually have very good technology. This is very high tech. And in some ways, the, the laboratory hasn't changed that much. And it might be very tempting to think that all you need in the microbiology laboratory is one of these high tech machines. But actually, is there more uh, to it than just having one of these machines in the lab? And just to remind you at the moment, blood cultures are the gold standard for diagnosis of bloodstream infections. People talk about molecular, I don't think we would be able to afford molecular. And actually, if you look at the, if you optimize the pathway, I don't think there'd be much difference in terms of turnarounds for many of them. Rapid results are associated with improved outcomes. There are differences in the literature, but there are certainly ones which show an improvement in outcomes. And what we're talking about here, is there a role of improved antimicrobial stewardship with the blood culture pathway? So with any pathway, you can divide it into pre-analytical, analytical, analytical and post-analytical. The pre-analytical is really the right patient, the right volume of blood, and you get it onto the analyzer with a minimum of delay. For processing, it's the shortest time to the key result, and we'll talk about what the key result is, and then using that information to manage the patient with minimum delay. And this is a relay race. You have to be strong in all components. It'd be no good having Usain Bolt in a relay race and having me as part of it. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So you need to be strong on all three. So we go back to pre-analytical. So it's the right patient. It's not just a patient with a fever and they may be hypothermic, confused, the elderly. But it's also the right volume of blood. We know that the amount of blood you culture, especially in adults, is absolutely critical to making the diagnosis. And it's very tempting to think when a blood culture comes in, it actually contains the right volume. But if you actually look at it, so if you pair, if you put together the aerobic and anaerobic bottle, you should have between 16 and 20 mLs. Uh, and this is what we found in our organization. Uh, only 25% of bottles, and lots of other people have done this. I mean, when you're looking at this, one mil per bottle, your chances of actually detecting a bacteremia are remote. And part of the problem is, if you actually look at it, 
You don't need, these have only got one mil in them. If you look at them, you can't, a, lot, a small amount of blood goes a long way. You can't actually tell. And a lot of the new machines now will actually measure the blood culture volumes for you automatically. So you've got a ready resource to actually use. Um, some, it's few now, but there are some laboratories who only use one bottle in an adult set. They only use the aerobic. They say anaerobes are not important. Uh, I just want to show you this. This is a time to flagging positive. And 80% of blood cultures flag quicker in the anaerobic bottle than the aerobic. And part of the reason is oxygen is actually toxic. Well, it inhibits a lot of the, uh, the organisms which can ferment. Uh, the one exception is uh, strep pneumonia. This either comes up quicker in the aerobic bottle or at the same time in both bottles. And why that is, it's actually got an enzyme which will actually neutralize the toxicity of oxygen. It can then actually ferment in the aerobic bottle. And the aerobic bottle, because organisms which grow preferentially in the aerobic bottle produce less acid, it actually it has, uh, it, 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 it's easier to get the pH change uh, because it doesn't have so many neutralizers to actually stop the pH changing. So it always comes up first. So if you see streps in both bottles, if it comes up in the anaerobic bottle, it ain't going to be a, a pneumo. If it's come up in the, an, in the aerobic bottle first, it may well be a pneumo. And this is just showing you the, 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 the time delay. Was the buffering was the word I was looking back for. Now the buffering is different between the aerobic and anaerobic bottle. And whilst this is modest for some of these, remember when you operate a laboratory with a trip system, so if you only operate up to 8 o'clock at night, Something which flagged up at 9 o'clock at night is, not gonna, is gonna be left to the next day. If you can just bring that back an hour, you, you will actually speed up your results by 24 hours. But you can see some of these are actually considerable, uh, the difference. So, and I think using an aerobic bottle by itself is wrong for all sorts of reasons. You're not culturing the right volume of blood. And actually, anaerobes, people say you can rely on metronidazole. I went to work in Ireland last year, and even amongst anaerobes, you can now find some highly resistant organisms. Uh, they had a bacteroides frangilis there, which they had to treat with linezomid. So it's the right volume. Ideally, it should be two sets. Um, Vivian Weston, uh, uh, this is up in Sheff, in, uh, they're in Nottingham, they take two sets. Interestingly, they've got one of the highest rates of bacteremia in the country. Uh, one of the Hospitals, which has got the lowest rate, only uses an aerobic bottle only. But if you use two bottles, you get into trouble for having a higher bacteremia rate. You don't get questioned if you've got a low rate. And this is data from Shabnamaya. There you get 50% extra positives. So once you've collected it, uh, you need to get it to where it belongs. And in only one place it really belongs, that's on the analyzer. Then it's processing to get the key result. And the key information is going to vary with the patient and with the <coughs> organism. So for example, for a neonate, a 36-hour negative blood culture, if the child's otherwise well, the other markers are down, this would allow you to stop uh, antibiotics. For a yeast, the gram stain is often the main thing which drives it. Um, if you, as Tom was talking about, if you think somebody's got a, a, a community-acquired pneumonia and you see a gram negative, that's going to change treatment. But for gram positives on the whole, if this is a significant pathogen, if you get an ID rapidly, you can manage that patient because we can actually predict the antibiotic sensitivities for gram positives. For gram negatives, it's much more difficult. Most of them are going to be E. coli in the blood culture, and it's the sensitivities which you need in order to make decisions. So once you've got this, you need to then get it uh, to the clinical teams and really we should be in a position now where we can either upscale or de-escalate and should be able to do this 24 hours a day. And actually, I don't see why if we develop algorithms, if you start getting blood culture results at night, the pinch point is the medical microbiologist. But many of these things, it's simple interactions. So if it's a gram-negative unsuspecting, it would be a slight modification. If they're already on augmentin for a chest, it would be like adding in a dose of gent. I think many of them, if we really wanted to, we could actually manage without having to wake the microbiologist up all the time. So we talked about the patient comes in with a sepsis 6, and with that, <laughs> the clock starts. We're conscious of time in that first hour. They have a blood culture taken, broad-spectrum antibiotics, and once that's done, really we become we're not so worried about time. The patient gets shunted on and, you know, and it's a production line and another patient comes in. And in the first 24 hours it's actually difficult to assess whether somebody's actually responding clinically to treatment. 
But actually there's one thing which can make a difference, and that is actually the blood culture. And it's thinking how quickly we're actually processing this. This is actually a recent review, the effectiveness of, of timeliness of blood cultures and what they said. It's linked to a number of, uh, it, it's rapid processing, you can read, is linked to a number of things, possibilities. A, it shows a significant number of patients who come in are not on one effective agent, but you can reduce mortality, morbidity, length of stay, antibiotic use, and healthcare expenses. But the other thing is, I think as Tom says, it's very important, it's often the microbiology result which is actually driving, challenging that diagnosis. Because when people come in, they get shifted through a number of teams before they actually get to a ward where there's a physician who's going to review it. Nobody wants to challenge that chest X-ray which doesn't show anything and is highly unlikely to be a, a pneumonia. <coughs> so it, the, it's the blood cultures. So this was the UK standards, and these were updated in 2012. Saying they've gone backwards slightly, I think. Anyway, two of the key things there were you should audit your pathway, and it was the first time that actually set a, a standard where it set critical time standards for critical control points. So we decided to set up a multidisciplinary team, blood science, microbiologists, uh, BMSs and, and, and clini uh, clinical microbiologists, and clinical teams. So we've set up the group, and this was our pathway. So a sample would come in. We were using glass bottles that needed a porter. This is a small hospital, DGH. We're doing 10,000 blood culture sets a year, so that was potentially 10,000 portering journeys. It came to specimen reception downstairs. It came up into microbiology, and during the day, if positives uh, signal positive, they'll be removed during normal working hours. And at night, it was either left at room temperature or in the incubator. So what the first step we decided to do there's microbiology on the first floor. We move the, the analyzer down into blood science. Here's a centralized reception. There's the analyzer. Uh, you can see the air tube in the background. And they were very happy without any extra payment. They're in there to actually load the blood culture analyzer at night. In fact, they even enter the demographic data. With a modern analyzer, you don't even need to enter the demog demographic data. And they've got this picture there because they believe even the simple thing of actually loading the analyzer is having an impact on patient care. So after that, this is what our pathway looked like. The blood culture analyzer was now in specimen reception. We had some software which would alert us or they would ring us from blood science uh, uh, when it flagged positive. Um, but at night, uh, it, we went a stage further. They were happy to actually remove the blood cultures. They couldn't do a gram stain. A gram stain is actually quite difficult to do. But they would set it up on plates, set up direct conventional sensitivities and put up some rapid sensitivities. So after we'd, we'd moved the analyzer downstairs, we looked at our times, and it's, 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 it, things got worse. It's very interesting, the dynamics of the group, how quick people are to blame. Um, so anyway, when they thought about it, and actually if you remove the contaminants, which are variable in number and actually quite slow growing, actually matters had improved for the pathogens. And if you went down to E. coli, you could see there was about a 20% reduction in time to positivity. So we thought E. coli actually may be a good way of comparing our cells with other laboratories. It's common, rarely a contaminant, and because it's frequent, you can have a look to see how other laboratories are doing. Uh, you'll see these large uh, oblongs at the bottom. This is just so people at the back, it's just showing the time and hours. So this is from our time from collection to placement on the analyzer, and this graph isn't complete, so I'd hate to say there were actually some out there taking more than 24 hours, even though this is all on the same site. So it was actually one of the uh, blood science people who said to us, well, why don't you use plastic bottles? Yeah, actually, not a bad idea. So when we were using glass, roughly, uh, uh, roughly one in five of our blood cultures were taking more than four hours uh, before it was loaded on the analyzer. So we did a publicity campaign, and then as we were running low, we removed all the blood culture bottles so the hospital simultaneously went across the plastic. And whilst there was an improvement, we got stuck. Now, one in 20 was still taking more than four hours. Um, so when we talked to the clinicians on our group, they said, well, actually, nobody had ever told them a blood culture was urgent. It wasn't taught at medical school or afterwards. Um, not that we were worried about them, that you know, maybe they were atypical, but we thought, well, let, let's actually do an audit of other people in the hospital to see if what they're saying is right. So we disguised it slightly. We included a CSF and urines, 
And what people said was 91% thought a CSF was, should be sent urgently, 68 would send a blood culture, but out of hours, roughly half would only send it. But the interesting other figure was 28% of staff thought it took 48 hours before you could get a result from a blood culture. And one of the reasons for this is we do this. I don't know why we do it. We stand out like a lot of laboratories a negative result at 48 hours. I don't know why. Um, and so they thought at 48 hours, you went and took the blood cultures off, put it on the analyzer, and either said no or it said yes. Uh, and the other thing was, many of them have worked in ED departments, blood science gets fired off in the air tubes, and the blood cultures sit in a box and somebody might come and empty that once or maybe twice a day, again reinforcing that these are not urgent. So we had two very good junior staff, I don't know how they did it. Anyway, they went away and taught people and they came up with some posters. Everybody liked this poster in the hospital. Nobody had any problems with this. So it was to make the link. Um, everybody liked the next poster, apart from the managers. They got a bit upset about this poster and didn't want it to be put into uh, <laughs> public areas. But I think it's, it's actually, um, I think it's, it, it, it's telling the truth. So after they did it, everything just fell into place. And we actually repeated it after these two junior doctors left and it was working. We were loading 96% of blood cultures actually within 90 minutes of collection. And when you think about it, if you're seeing somebody who's unwell, you're not just taking a blood culture, you're taking other bloods. And we had this bizarre situation where the left hand would put something in the pod, the right hand would just leave the blood cultures lying in the ward. Once you know you pod both of these, it all falls into place. And where it takes over 90 minutes, you can often find there's an underlying problem. So what was the impact? Well, the first thing was uh, the neonatal people loved it. We were returning these 100% within, th within uh, uh, 38 hours. And we know they like it um, because occasionally the interface would go down and they're ringing up and asking. And if you're a junior doctor, you don't want to have to go and bleed a neonate to do a gent level. It's not fun. Um, so the first hospital we compared ourselves was against a teaching hospital, which had gone some way to actually uh, uh, in optimizing the blood culture pathway. They provided a service to two other hospitals which had lost their labs, but they didn't include that data. So this is only uh, blood cultures collected on site. So ours is a blue, we're loading 96%, and this is their load just on the same site. And it takes roughly 17 hours before they achieved what could be done in 90 minutes. We then went on to do a regional audit, and the first thing to say is, here, there's, there's an, on a number of sites, some blood cultures are taking more than 24 hours from collection before they're being placed on the analyzer. And if you look in greater detail, for some reason, the nearest hospital, again, was 17 hours. And that was us. So the other thing we asked people to do was to remove 30 consecutive E. coli positive blood cultures, look at the time from collection uh, to the flagging positive. And this is the data we got. So the nearest one was about 50%, but the others were more than twice, or two and a half times. Uh, but that wasn't the end of the story. So this is the time differential, but the time before to you actually get the results uh, becomes even more. And I'll try and explain it with this. So this is a timeline uh, uh, from uh, 8 o'clock in the evening through to 12 o'clock on day 3. So if the lab say is shut and this flags up positive in a conventional laboratory, it will be removed from the analyzer next morning. But often there's a bottleneck, so there's lots of blood cultures you're trying to remove. Hopefully, if you've got a mouldy, you'll have an ID either very quickly within four hours and you have your sensitivities the following day. If you've optimized it, it's removed from the analyzer. We know within, within on average, within less than 20 minutes it's removed. You normally have the organism on your plate already growing the next morning. You can put it straight in the mouldy. You don't have this backlog. Um, you may actually have rapid sensitivity results uh, able to read, and the conventional sensitivities are normally available. So now the gap uh, becomes uh, even greater. So just to summarize this, um, you can load 96% within 90 minutes. Your hemolytic strips start coming up from six hours onwards, the majority by 12, the pneumos take a bit later. And if you can do even just a rapid latex, you can start managing these patients if you, uh, uh, straight away. Um, most of your E. coli's will have flagged positive by 12 hours. This is the percentage of blood cultures where you communicate to the clinical teams. And remember, 
if you're talking to somebody who knows the patient, this can actually be a thorough review actually of the patient, and this can lead to changes in antibiotics, not, not even based on what you've got, but reviewing them and finding that and going, sometimes it's just going through the previous microbiology somebody hasn't looked at and then they've got a resistant organism. So by the end of day one, uh, we could, from collection to actually issuing an ID with sensitivities for a gram negative, just under half could be completed within 24 hours. And it was wonderful. You'd actually go down in the early morning ward rounds, a post tank, you'd be there just about to see the patient and you could say what we've got, you could make a plan and actually uh, do the changes in just uh, 24 hours. And if you move on in time, so at 36 hours, roughly 88%, and comparing this with the teaching hospital, which had partially optimized the pathway, it's not till over 60 hours that they've actually got the same level of results. Uh, this is just to show you how quickly organisms do come up in blood culture. So your group A's, and remember, a number of, some group A's are very easy. They present with a clinical picture. Others, they present with no clues to what's going on. And group A, it's not just the antibiotic. It may be the type of antibiotic. You may want to give clindamycin or something to switch off the toxin. You may actually want to give immunoglobulin. The other thing is when you do this is you start seeing there's a divide between coagulase negative staphs and staph aureuses. And we say any staph, provided it hasn't been taken through a line, coming up within 12 hours or less, I've never seen anything different. That will be a staph aureus by default, default. So just to give you, I'm afraid these are anecdotes and this is all you ever get, but this is a patient who came in, came in late Friday night, next morning went into the lab. Uh, it taken eight hours, 36. They did a direct group on the blood culture as a group G strep. Actually rang up, the patient was on oral clarithromycin. Uh, got the patient switched <coughs> to tycoplane and, and clindamycin. And this was microbiology actually driving people to go. The patient didn't seem that unwell and actually had a very stormy next 48 hours and he went home on day six with cellulitis. I can't say he would have died this patient but I think there's a good chance if that result hadn't been there he might have died. That's just to give you another one uh, this was on a Friday <coughs> patient admitted with DNV blood culture collected at 10.30 in the morning and, and eight hours later staph in both bottles, this is going to be a staph aureus, actually talked to the clinician, wasn't sure what was going on, very non-specific illness, switched to high dose flu clocks, talked about looking for a focus and honest to God he was just about to do an echo when this patient's valve cup ruptured and they were sent over to uh, Sheffield for a successful valve replacement. So these are some of the benefits we've talked about, we don't see this thing where we think organisms of lives like pneumos and the other thing is, and I'll just show you at the end, is you know, unless you've done the front part of the pathway, if you start bolting on machinery to the end, you're not getting the full gain from that machinery. In fact, it's even worse than that because you will have global studies done actually looking at new equipment. Uh, and if you've put it into a pathway which is not optimised, you may come out showing this hasn't, is no benefit really to patients in terms of morbidity or mortality. But you've not given that equipment the chance to see whether it makes a difference if time is of the essence. With empirical treatment, as Tom was talking about, you, we don't go for something which is 100% effective. We're always as, accepting a degree of failure. Um, this is when we looked at 106 positive blood cultures. We found a third were not on effective treatment. And it depends what you use up front, but this was a multi-centre study done in the UK, again showing 34% not an effective treatment. Uh, sorry, this is one more anecdotal case. This is somebody came with query biliary sepsis, was start on Carl Mox, but changed to Tazis, and I apologise to Tom if he's still here. Um, they, because the patient was unwell, the blood culture was taken at HOPOS 1, it was loaded just after HOPOS 2. It flagged positive in the early hours and was subcultured. Nothing was growing on the conventional sensitivities at 9 o'clock, but we had this. So we had an MIC to gentamicin. We knew it was resistant. We know where we are. If it's gent resistant, it's often tazacin resistant. We changed the patient to meropenem and that was confirmed. And I'd, I would guess that many other places, uh, it, would be, it would not be until 24 hours later till the patient was put on effective treatment. Um, I don't know if people have seen the Merino study, which is actually saying if you've got an ESBL, mm -hmm. really, you should be using a carbapenem. Uh, this is three drops of, of, of a positive blood culture containing gram-negative rods that have been spread on this. This is just conventional kefpadoxin, kefpadoxin, clav. You could either add kefepime or kefpironin, clav. And this is just time-lapse photography. And here you can see that's hours and minutes. And 
So you can see, you, for, for a small amount of money, you can detect ESBLs rapidly uh, in four hours if, you want, if people actually want to do it. Um, so when we looked at what would have corrected the initial therapy, and it actually fits in what Tom was saying, is what we were surprised at, it was a gram stain which actually corrected most. Antibiotic resistance wasn't that much of a problem. But the thing is, if we haven't optimized our pathway and we're going to start getting more and more of these CPEs, this is going to become a second bulge in where failure of empirical therapy. And it's not surprising. I mean, this is where people have got the wrong focus and things like that. But if you think about it, people at the front are terribly pressurized. There's a range of skills there. There's a range of patients. You can give good histories to patients now who are coming with dementia. It's very difficult. So mistakes will be made. And really, the function of the lab is as a backstop. We're there to support, because this is never going to be 100% at the front door. So we get a patient coming in. Uh, that happens. And then the, the, they migrate later on. And what we're saying is that, that we should start smart and focus. And really, uh, these, two, these two are a continuum. And the, they're linked by the blood culture pathway. I just want to show you here. So really, if you get a gram positive there and you get an ID, most of them are positive within 12 hours, so 16 to 17 hours. If you've got an ID and it's a significant pathogen, you can be managing this patient antibiotic-wise. And now, if it's a gram negative, and you'll be hearing, if you get an ID and you can get sensitivities, you can manage the majority of them in less than 24 hours because it's possible to get sensitivities. Um, and what effect could this have on diagnostic stewardship? Well, they say there's roughly uh, 100,000 bacteremias a year. This is probably a gross underestimate because we're not actually culturing uh, a, the, the right amount of blood in the one blood culture set we're doing. I'll show you the national, day, uh, the national data, let alone taking two sets. It could easily be 120, I'm sure it's more. But in here, if 20%, you could reduce it back by 24 hours. The number of days saved of antibiotics would be 54 years of improved. If you went up to 40% uh, for 48 hours, you're looking, you know, I don't think it's, it's somewhere, but the potential benefit is actually quite high. So this is just a, a quick snapshot of the National Blood Culture Survey, uh, which was, I think it might be the first survey actually done uh, globally. This is done through the AMR Diagnostic Stewardship. And for those of you who replied, thank you very much. Um, we had quite a good response rate, 158. This is where it was across the country. Um, and this is very, and 124 on-site laboratories. So the first thing was for people audited the critical uh, uh, control points, time, had they audited it? And roughly, I'd say there's a 50-50 split. Some, some people had never audited the blood culture pathway. Um, um, however, when you ask people for specific information, this drops significantly. We only had 32 hospitals now. And this is the percentage of blood cultures loaded within four hours. So these, were, these hospitals were doing quite well. There were three who actually loaded 100% within four hours. It can be done. And then you can see this quite big gap going down to here, where a tenth... Uh, the, uh, a tenth of them had only missed, at the most, 10% within four hours. And what was interesting out of the 24-hour labs, although two of the 100% ones came from there, even with 24-hour labs, look at this, they're not loading their blood cultures in a timely manner. Where we've got full data, so this is excluding the 100% the, the, the loads, if you look at the gold, these are where blood cultures are taking more than 24 hours. And some, these were certainly on the same site because some of these hospitals didn't have a, uh, weren't supplying it to another hospital. And look at this, you know, if you look at the grey, this is between 12 to 24 hours in this one hospital, more than 50%. This is the last time the laboratory processes a positive blood culture during the normal, during the weekday. So there's quite a bit of variation from 2 o'clock in the afternoon up to midnight. And this variation becomes more pronounced uh, mm -hmm. at weekends and bank holidays. So in the lab here, something flagging up just after 12 o'clock may be sitting on the analyzer for 21 hours uh, before it's removed in the following day. Yet, these are essentially the same patients throughout the country with the same diagnosis. This is where the blood cultures are loaded uh, outside of hours. I won't go into as much detail, but actually, this is the only place where they should be. 
There's data which has come out of Italy which shows for every hour that a blood culture doesn't make it onto the analyse, it's delayed, you lose 0.3% of your positives. If you put it in an incubator, if you overcook some organisms, so they go through the growth phase, uh, they may then register negative on your, when you put them on the blood culture analyzer. So organisms, non-fermenters and yeast, which don't produce enough acid, they won't be detected once they've gone through the final growth. That's where it should be. Some people are putting satellite blood culture incubators, interestingly, into some uh, units. Uh, this is just to show the split between glass and plastic, and most people are using plastic now, but this is just to show you most people are actually only collecting one set, and I would guess uh, 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 not a good set, just like our cells. Uh, and one site was actually quite honest, it said despite them recommending two sets in practice, it didn't really happen. Um, this is an order of blood culture volumes. Most people don't audit the blood culture volumes. Uh, six or seven may able to, to give. These were actually quite good. I was surprised that they had the correct fill. Uh, and these are the initiatives that have been done. And lastly, if, if you line up everything, so, um, if you've got, if you, so if you've got plastic, you can pod it. If you've got an air tube system, which actually, uh, if it goes to microbiology, that's a bit of a nuisance out of ours, but if it actually goes to a centralised reception where you've got a 24-hour shift in, in blood sciences, you should, provided you've taught people clinically, at least more than half of the laboratories should be able to load their blood cultures within four hours, 24 hours a day, without really any extra cost to the NHS. So why do these things go wrong? And I hope to just explain it in these last few slides. So what do these have in common? This is a sepsis 6, very laudable, collect a blood culture within one hour. This is a national confidential inquiry into patient outcomes and deaths. It looked to see whether a blood culture was collected. And this was it, you know, thinking that all there is to blood cultures is having a machine in the lab. And they're all linked by endpoints which do not link the timeliness of the specimen result to patient care. Um, if you talk to clinicians, they know their blood science results should be back in an hour, but we've got an intrinsic problem with blood cultures because of their innate variability. Nobody knows when a blood culture is actually going to flag positive. And because of this, it allows poor, it provides a shroud beh behind which poor practice can flourish, and order is the key. But it goes beyond this. If there are delays in the blood culture pathway and you're a clinician seeing somebody's now going downhill, you can't match the delay to the patient becoming unwell. But one person did an error, and it was this person, I don't think this is the exact representation of them, and this was the coroner. They looked into some high profile deaths out there and they found the turnaround time in blood cultures was unacceptable. The other thing is we, we, we do have, uh, you know, we've got the CQC, we've also got our equivalent in microbiology, is the ISO standards, but they focus on one aspect. And it's, as Bridget Lamy says, in fact, there's, there's a in growing dissatisfaction with ISO standards in France and some other because they're taking large sums of money out of laboratories and not giving anything back. And she says, it, is that accreditation focused excessively on technical details rather than patient value? which results in an inappropriate clinical service, quality being disconnected from the endpoint. It's a very good paper if you get a chance to read it because she shows all the things that uh, we're being told to do, like do false, you know, rig up positives, absolutely meaningless. Um, and the other thing is this, I think, and I think this slide probably speaks for itself. And they're in no man's land. As Tom was saying, we need to get, as Neil was saying, we need to get together, work as groups, and actually sort out these problems. Um, and this is one place where they did it. It's a nice paper. This was Staff Ori's back to Remis, and by actually doing the whole of the relay race, <laughs> they got a 13% reduction in mortality from Staph aureus back to Remis. And again, this is just one of the, uh, you know, big group here again saying before you start introducing all of these bits of equipment get the pathway right because that's what's going to give you your biggest uh, yield. Um, this is just again I've shown you this before I don't think you need to see that so um, so we might have these conflicting targets but it's got to be timely though. 
So I'll leave you to decide whether the bacteria you, you put your money on or whether it's a microbiologist. And I'm a microbiologist. And <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much.